Um, but for those who don't know me, my name is Sam. Uh, I am a community manager. I work for Sneak. So I help developers adopt security into their software development workflows. We run DevSecCon, which is a community of about 30 of these types of communities globally. Um, and so really excited to be. I've known the TRG, TRG team for a very, very long time. Um, so it's nice to be back. Uh, before I get on to introducing our lovely uh, panelists today, I just want to remind you that this panel is for you. I have luckily been able to talk to all of them beforehand, and I've got some great, hopeful questions here. But, you know, sort of to get the most out of it, I want for you to be able to ask questions as well. So I'll give time for questions, but if our panelists are speaking about something and you're like, I want to know more about that or a follow-on question to that, just put your hand up. Like, let's just break the flow and have a chat. If asking questions scares you, it does to me. I'm even a bit nervous now kicking off um, and you've got your heart pumping and you're like, maybe I'll ask and then you psych yourself up and you're like, no, I won't ask it. <laughs> Just do it. It's a few minutes of feeling uncomfortable to get an answer. You also might be helping someone else in the room that either doesn't know they need to ask that question or doesn't feel comfortable asking that question on their learning journey. So two minutes of awkwardness means hopefully a lifetime of knowledge. But that's enough from me. We have some great, amazing panelists. We've got Dida, who I've, uh, who I've known for a very long time. So super excited to be joining the stage with her. Georgina, who has an epic background. So hopefully a lot to learn from her tonight. We've also got Gerard. Um, obviously, we are used to being the minority in a tech space. Gerard is our only male on the panel today. Uh, so a huge round of applause to him for being able to be vulnerable and share his experiences with us. It is not easy. Uh, and last but definitely not least, uh, Sarah, who's also had a very interesting career journey and hopefully from some of the conversations I've had during the networking uh, part of this evening, hopefully we'll be able to enlighten and answer some questions. But before we get started, that is not the greatest intro for all of our uh, hosts. So I'd actually love them to intro themselves. Actually, a huge round of applause to them. First. Tadar, can you take a few minutes? Also, one last thing. If you can't hear us because we have no mics, we will try our best to project our voices, but sometimes we get excited and start mumbling. Just put your hand on your head if you can't hear. We'll keep an eye out and learn to project. So hands up for questions, hands on head for I can't hear you. Panelists, if they've got their hands on their heads, speak up. Great, good system? Great. Over to you, Tadar. Who are you? Who am I? <laughs> what am I doing here? Um, I work at Just Eat. Um, I'm one of the senior tech managers in the information security department. I look after risk compliance and data security. But I do not have a tech background. So I studied business administration and then I got into auditing, risk, compliance. And I've been there ever since, um, really enjoying it. I guess that's me. We will, you will hear from me a lot. Um, me, so. Thank you so much. And Georgina. Hi, I'm Georgina. I'm an engineering manager at Silvara. Um, we are a carbon data product with a mission to incentivize investment in real climate action. Um, I lead the API foundation team where we look to create the most efficient and fastest ways to allow our clients to use our data. Outside of my day to day, I'm very, very passionate about diversity, equity and inclusion. I work with a variety of different companies and organizations to um, help through public speaking, coaching and then most recently working with UN Women UK as a delegate. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Gerard. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jared. I'm uh, really happy to be here. I um, lead the data science team at Mplan. Um, so Mplan is a startup. We work in construction, um, not that sexy, but what we do is we use machine learning to forecast the outcome of construction projects and help identify where delay might occur. Um, so I've been there for two and a half years. I lead um, a majority like female team and also um, started the DEI committee um, a few years ago with other members of the company and have been learning a lot along the way um, and yeah excited to learn from the fellow panelists here as well so I feel like also an attendee as well as a, a speaker. Thank you. Hi everybody I'm Sarah and I'm an engineering manager at Rightmove. It's a few companies that I don't have to explain what Rightmove does usually, which is quite good. Um, within Rightmove, I kind of work with our customer domain. So if you think of Rightmove, there's 
our consumers, but there's also estate agents and people. So, um, the teams I work with look after the property and location data and all the APIs and making sure they're available for all the other teams to use. Um, and my background's very much been in development. I used to be a developer. I spent a long time being a developer and kind of stepped away from that to become an engineering manager where I kind of really enjoy developing teams and people. And as part of my experience, I think I've seen a lot of change and um, things that have made the space great for women to come into. So I'm always kind of a great, it's really nice to be an opportunity to advocate. Some tech's a great place for women to be. And yeah, it's not perfect, but through these kind of forums, we kind of get the conversation going. So happy to be here. Kind of following on from that, obviously, there's loads of uh, plays that we can improve um, with diversity and women in tech, but I think we've also come a long way. Um, and so I'd actually love to kick off the panel, maybe talking a little bit about those positive changes. And so, Sarah, maybe you could share some insights into how the you know, technology industry has changed in terms of diversity and the progress that we have achieved. I'm good for answering this one because I've been around a while. I think I, so my traditional route, I went and did a typical kind of journey through a degree back in the 90s. So that's when I started my career in tech and there was very few women. I think uh, my first job, I was the only female in the whole floor doing tech. Um, and having kind of watched it evolve now, if I think of where, I, where we are in a company, we're very close to being 50-50 within Rightmove and other companies, obviously it, it changes, but for me, the transition has been slow and steady. And I think as we've, companies have recognized, a lot of it's our own thing. People don't, I think women are now recognizing that there is a suitable career and a lot of flex about that is about flexibility and opportunity. So for me, I found as you, if your life goes through stages, it's been about having the right opportunity, people advocating for us in that space. And that's what I've found has been really helpful. And thinking back where it was, it seems quite unrecognizable. And it's quite nice to be able to, yes, we've got work to do, but I think we've made a huge amount of progress. And I think it's down to advocates and generational thinking as well. I think it's the world's different place, people thinking differently, recognizing it, and through these sort of forums and educating the value that we can do and offering flexible working or whatever it is that's been missing um, for women to help us in there has, has worked. That's been, I've personally benefited a lot from that kind of changes. I don't think I could have stayed in the in sector if it had stayed as it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I've had three children. Um, I couldn't have done it if it had been how it was. So mm. definitely evolved. I also think the evolution of bringing everyone into the conversation, the first ever women in tech panel ever did, there wasn't one man in the audience. And even today we can see like a diverse, you know, sort of it's getting better and bringing people in that want to hear about how best we can be supported and how we are managed differently and the needs we have are differently. Sorry, the needs we have are different. So um, it's also lovely to see that these forums are also diversifying and bring people together. If we take it one step sort of higher in terms of, you know, sort of, keep on saying sort of. Um, Georgina, you know, with your role as a delegate uh, UN Women UK, you know, what changes have you seen in terms of sort of more that step back and the changes that are being made? Um, yeah, so we had the commission on the status of women at the beginning of this year. I doubt many of you have heard of it. Um, it's basically COP, but for women. Um, and it's a bit upsetting that most people haven't heard of it. But we started that um, conference with the fact that if we continue at the rate of progress that we have right now, it's going to be 300 years till we reach gender equality. So I wish I had well better done. news. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick. Sorry. <laughs> but there's just so much more that we can do here. Um, I think the positives that I've seen is how we're considering gender alongside a lot of these other issues. So with climate change, Typically, like these changes in environments impact women a lot more because of the like gendered roles that we have in society still. Um, so considering how these bigger 
um, issues are affecting women um, and making sure that we're putting in place policies that will help like proactively address that. Um, other things that we were talking about this year, the focus of the conference was around tech um, and how we can leverage tech to um, reduce this gap. So looking at like different trainings and that sort of thing. Um, and then I guess like within the UK, we definitely are starting to recognize we have an issue with like the amount of people coming into tech and then particularly like after the launch of ChatGPT and the boom of AI this year, looking at how the lack of diversity of the people building these products is going to impact gender and other like underrepresented groups long term. Um, so I think like fundamentally, I believe like if we have, if we empower diverse teams, we can build um, products that will have a better resonance with society um, and therefore like um, help re reduce like this um, disparity of equity that we have right now. Yeah, I never thought about it in terms of sort of wider than tech in terms of climate change and things like that and how that can affect um, women more because of the roles we play. Um, maybe going on to keeping with the roles you play. Now, I know, Sarah, from our discussions prior to this panel, we spoke a bit about your return to work journey. Uh, obviously, you have been in the industry for a very long time, but there was a period of time where you weren't uh, and you were taking on other roles. Do you share us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as a I kind of started in tech and had a lovely career, enjoyed what I did, and then um, had my first child, and that was lovely. But back then, sort of the early 2000s, it kind of felt really challenging to um, have that career in tech and be a mum, and the, the balance just never sat right. It was always five days in the office, no flexible working. Um, it was just didn't work for women and you can see these changes why we're in a much better position now. So I ended up going on to have three children and during that time I didn't go back to work um, and it was never intentional. It was kind of I'll just one year, two years and then it suddenly felt I've, I can't go back. There's, you know, I've text moved on. Um, obviously I've had another focus for a long time. And as my kind of youngest, youngest one um, started to get ready for school, I'd been out for about sort of eight years or so. And I started to kind of get thinking, what am I going to do? I want to do something, but I don't know what it's going to be. And there's no opportunities for me to go back to the career I used to have. Um, and I did a few bits of STEM supporting through schools, but the actual idea of having a career was just not going to happen. And I just, through luck, came across um, a the idea of returnships. So these are kind of uh, a program that supports women back into a career that they previously had after a career break. So my opportunity came with Capgemini, who um, offered a program of supporting me back into work. They would supply training and coaching to upskill me and support me back in. And it was only, I feel very lucky that I had that opportunity because without, without it, I don't think I could have just stepped back into a career and I would have lost it. And I really did enjoy it. And having come back now, I feel I'm a much better person. I'm probably a better leader and I've got lots of better attributes for that experience. So there's lots of different ways of coming back into tech or, or doing it. So my message is always, it doesn't matter how long you've been out or how long it takes to upskill, there's opportunities there for us. So it's been, it was a really, that program really set me up. And then, um, yeah, here I am still kind of doing the job that I loved. Yeah, that's amazing. And such good, good to get that opportunity to do it. How many people in the audience don't come from quote unquote a tech background, so never studied computer science? Amazing, welcome. So I know, Dida, you know, sort of you did come from that background as well, studying business uh, administration. Can you maybe share a little bit about your journey and your transition? I think we'll also sort of shed light on the audience. So, yeah, so I studied business administration, but I wanted to do something in IT. We didn't have DevOps then, so it was, everything was IT. So in, I'm from Turkey and in Turkey, if you didn't study engineering, you don't get a job in IT. 
but uh, similar, uh, big four, uh, one of the big four company, companies, they had IT audit roles for entry level um, open. And I asked them, would they consider me? And they were like, yeah, we would consider because we teach everything on the job anyway. I applied, I got in, and that's how I got into um, some sort of um, adjacent to uh, IT. And then from there onwards, I uh, focused on security and security roles, risk, compliance. And up until four or five years ago, I would not consider myself technical. But then I realized that is keeping me uh, back from doing what I want to do, which I, all of a sudden I got a passion for tech, helping the engineers and developers doing secure, uh, security better and they weren't getting enough support. And I built the connections, but I was not able to help them because I was not enough technical. Then I started going to meetups, um, and that's how I learned a lot of stuff. And I also learned that I'm not bad with tech. Like, I can't do it. I'm, I, I can't code still, but I haven't really tried to. I'm sure if I give it, give it a good go, I could. But yeah, it's... It is something that is learnable. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a sticker on my laptop that says I don't write code, but I'm technical AF. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Because of that thing. Um, and I'm assuming sort of in that journey, a lot of our panelists today have had mentors or people that have like helped them navigate this world. Before we talk a little bit about mentorship, uh, Georgina, can you maybe just shed light on the different types of mentorship we get? Um, yeah, so broadly speaking, there's three different types of mentorship. There's um, technical, career, and situational. So technical, like, okay, I want to learn how to code. How do I start? And then you work with your mentor to come up with some goals, and they kind of can pair program with you and that sort of thing. Um, career is looking like, what do you want to do long term in your career? How do you break that down into different steps? What do you need to learn? Where are the best opportunities for you to get to these things? And then situational is more like, um, I've got this issue at work. I need to talk to someone about it. Um, and then there's like different types of mentoring relationships as well. Some's like very formal, like you are my mentor, I am your mentee. It's stated, we've got a relationship, we meet up every two weeks. <laughs> I don't know you. <laughs> 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 it's happened. You sign up. You want that, you sign up to me. Yeah, exactly, that's fine. Or it's um, more informal where I'm like, okay, I think I've got something that I've got an issue. I want to chat to you about it. Can we just work it through like on a one off basis, perhaps? Um, both are very valuable. Um, and yeah. yeah. I find if someone asks me, will you be a mentor? It kind of freaks me out a bit. I'm like, ah. Oh but realize that, you know, we chat all the time at work, we help each other. And so, yes, it is obviously really good to find a dedicated mentor that you meet up with for specific reasons, but know that like, there's lots of people in your environment that you are mentoring and you're getting mentorship from. Um, and so, you know, there are official channels and other ways. Now, Dida, um, I'd love to, for you, you spoke very briefly about it, that you started going to meetups, mm -hmm. um, and obviously you had some mentors within work and different people who helped you along the way. Could you maybe share some of those experiences and maybe how you got this role here? Yeah. So, um, yes, um, when I first moved to the UK, um, I was jobless for like 10 months, then I found a good job to start. Um, and my manager there also became my mentor. And my manager's managers became my sponsor. She was uh, really uh, giving me good opportunities to go and um, pursue in the company. I changed teams uh, to get my skills, upskill myself in another area, for example. And um, I, through also that company, I received coaching, which also I can say changed my life. Coaching, I, I, it's very different than mentoring. Um, coaching is like therapy, but in a, <laughs> in a work situation or, or a, a very specific thing you wanna um, get over. And my, for me, that, that has always been my confidence. I was just, I knew I was smart, but I couldn't like uh, put the words uh, to show that I'm smart. And that confidence was keeping me again um, back. So um, yeah, the coaching I received twice now. And again, for the technical stuff, I 
found the meetups and I went to so many meetups, but I stuck with a few of them as the communities because those communities made me feel very welcome, that I, I connected with that, those people. And, um, and just it used to host, uh, like now, a lot of meetups. So I was coming here almost every month <laughs> and uh, I was meeting new Just Eat people at every different meetup. Um, and Just Eat was one of, my, uh, one of the sponsors of this biggest community that I was a part of, the Ladies of London Hacking Society. Um, so yeah, I got to know them and I, yeah, that's a very weird say, thing to say perhaps, but they're like women's sanitary items in the toilets. And that was like a, really differentiator for me <laughs> something very small but i felt like oh these guys really care and then i started knocking on their door uh, for a job uh, but they were always looking for engineer level security people and i was like mm, not me not me but then during the pandemic they're like now we need someone who understands risk and compliance and i was like yes thank you <laughs> and yeah the interview was like a chat um, a nice chat and I got I suppose it's so good to see that in terms of a lot of people don't really understand how to navigate communities as a way to find work and that, you know, we go to one event, we meet some people and we're like, oh, there wasn't anything there and that it is a long term game. Also, the nice thing about that to the, you know, sanitary products in the bathroom or other things, when you're in an interview process, the managers will paint this very cookie cutter picture of how great it is to work there. And then you start on the first day and you're like, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> Go to enough meetups, you'll hear exactly what it's like to work there, and then you can choose whether that is something you want to do. But I'd also say, listen to what someone's saying. If someone's moaning about the fact that they get no direction and you thrive in autonomy, maybe, you know, that rolls for you. Or they're bragging about the fact that they get yoga every day. I mean, yoga is great, but yoga with colleagues, not my cup of tea, but you know, so just also just listen to what people are saying. Um, and there's also obviously the opportunity to have internal communities and, and, sp and spaces that help. I know, Gerard, you um, helped champion your DEI committee. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it helps to elevate humans within your organization? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess we are still relatively small, like 50 people, but um, it got to the point where we were uh, we'd raised a Series A, so we had some money and we were growing. And um, me and someone in my team were talking about how, you know, there's there's a lot of things still in the company that we think uh, we could do better in. And so four of us got together and decided to start the DI committee. We didn't we didn't really seek for approval to to start it. We just kind of got together and we're like, what can we do? And we started it with the idea that um, we didn't we didn't want to be the ones implementing everything. We wanted to figure out how we could raise awareness and uh, really empower everyone to be the champions, I guess, and to figure out how, um, how we can all contribute to making, in this case, and plan a better place to work. Um, and so I guess a lot of, some of the things we've done is we've really tried to uh, listen as much as possible to everyone in the company. So we run kind of regular surveys. We've got feedback that we uh, people are tired of filling out surveys. So we try to make them short and sweet, but try to understand how people are feeling across different teams, different roles. Um, and then try to figure out uh, how can we empower the people in different areas to do their job better and to raise awareness and to think about equity and diversity and inclusivity in their work. Um, so some of the areas that we're particularly proud of is we have, for example, um, for all of the managers, we have this like living set of uh, like a wiki in Notion where we keep track of, uh, we, we basically offer resources about how to manage people who might be neurodiverse or who might come from different backgrounds, who might work differently, what that means, and then how to provide structure for people who need structure or if people don't need structure, you know, how, how do you manage that? And it's been really helpful, particularly for uh, new managers like myself. Um, I was a new manager a couple of years ago, and it really helped me to understand what can I do, what can I learn from others to, to sort of be, uh, yeah, to be a better manager and empower my team. Um, so that's been that's been a really cool experience. Yeah, I really love that access to knowledge when it happens. We see it a lot. We run some internal communities at Sneak, and the people coming to those communities are kind of the people who get it a lot of the time and you're like oh why can't 
that person comes, they need to hear this. And so having this access to content um, all the time, regardless of, you know, sort of if you can make a impromptu event every now and then is super useful. Now, uh, Georgina, I know that when you were at McLaren, which we haven't spoken a lot about, um, you were part of the Driven Women community. Can you maybe tell us all about that and how maybe you met humans and leveraged that community? <laughs> sure. Um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I was at McLaren in their Formula One team. And if you know anything about Formula One, your assumption is probably true. There are no women in it. <laughs> um, so we had a driven women society, which spanned across all of McLaren's um, companies, which meant that we were able to network with a lot of women, um, kind of have like it's even just tea catch ups just to share experiences um, and share like learnings on how to deal with things. Um, I think with a lot of these groups, there's um, a lot of benefits like the networking, the driving change, driving like policy changes within your company. Um, but then also the events that the communities hold. So. Uh, we used to do a lot of panel discussions. Um, I was going through a particularly tough time with my team at one point and went to one of these panel discussions, met this incredible woman called Jackie Murray um, and just like ran up to her at the end of the event and like, accosted her. I was like, I've got this issue, can you help me? And she just kind of grabbed my notepad and like walked me through like, what a, what, how could I deal with it? How could I deal with like these difficult men? Um, and yeah, like finding mentors can be very, very difficult, but going to these panel events, a lot of the time, like you can kind of get to know people better. And so Jackie kind of became one of those situational mentors for me. Um, I don't know if she appreciates that that's what she became to me, but um, yeah, so when I was then transitioning into software, um, called her up, I was like, can we just walk through this problem? Like, I'm not feeling very confident about going into this new role. Um, and she just kind of helped settle my nerves and highlight to me like what my strengths were and how could I use what my existing skill set is in this like very new industry to me. Um, so I think like these employee groups can be very, very beneficial. Very beneficial. And yeah, that uneasiness of, you know, we're going to speak a little bit about imposter syndrome now. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the definition of imposter syndrome, it is, so the fear of the unknown, the fear of something you've never done before is a natural, normal fear. We all get it, regardless of your gender. Imposter syndrome is when you have a proven track record of doing something, you still have that fear. It could be that it's very tangible, so you can write code, but when you write it, you get freaked out. Or we've got these other skills, and then all of a sudden we don't think we can apply it to a new industry, but we've got those skills. We have a proven track record of doing X, Y, or Z, and yet we still have this fear of being an imposter. Um, now, I know, Sarah, with you, obviously, there must have been quite a few times in your career uh, where those feelings might have irked in. Um, is there any ways you've managed that? Any advice to the audience on maybe how to try mitigate some of those things before the imposter syndrome irks in and takes over? Oh, if I, when I get there and I have the answer, it'll be perfect. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm sitting here with these amazing panelists thinking, why am I, you know, what, what am I doing with this? That I'm not the same, per, you know, the, the, to be put in the same category. I think it's, I'll always feel like that. Um, but I guess talking about it as well reminds us, and I know in my role is I often, you know, I'm talking, I'm kind of supporting lots of women in their careers and their in engineering, and I listen to them. And I think really almost verbalizing it. Sometimes it's okay to say, I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable or I'm okay. And I think it's that reinforcing. And it, I would love it if that's not seen as a weakness. I think in a kind of patriarchal view, that's sort of being considered, that's a weakness, we don't do it. But the more we can say, I'm, um, you know, and people can say it's, no, you're good. And you have to kind of just talk to yourself because it's our, usually it's in our heads. I don't know if I've got a solution to it other than when you feel that vulnerability to kind of have an ally that you can go and talk to about it. Um, and I guess it's important this, I know there's some um, programs that you go on that's kind of reminds you to sort of say, well, I am good and reflect back on things you have done rather than the things you haven't or failed. We, our default is generally 
to look at what we can't do. Um, and the program I think I'm thinking of is like, I am remarkable. There's a free thing that's that. And it's, it's those little things that say, if you were to say to yourself, I am remarkable because we've all done it, we've all got some, but we find it very difficult to do. And what would you say? I kind of sometimes have to say, well, what, when I'm asking somebody that's come to me and said, they don't feel, I said, well, what would you say if somebody had come to you with these? And they go, well, I tell them to, that's rubbish, they've done this. It's like, so that's Just my only yourself, yeah. solution to it is to kind of understand, kind of just talk to people. And I think it's, yeah, I, I haven't got the solution to it. But I know I think that, that is I, it resonates. Lot. Yeah, um, I had someone do that for me. Um, and they helped me rewrite my CV when I was doing a bit of a career transition. And it sounded amazing. I was like, <laughs> I'd hire that person. And they were like, well, in, is any of it a lie? And I was like, I was like, no, but you make it sound so good. And they were like, well, you don't need to downplay your, you know, your skills and your strengths. So yeah, Georgina, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I love the I Am Remarkable workshops. I think they're really, really great. And I think like making sure you always have that list to go back to is so important. Like create this list of why are you remarkable as a human, but also like collecting little nuggets um, as you're going along in your day to day. Um, and like creating a brag doc of everything, like things you've done and what feedback you've received that when you have these weaker moments, then you can go back and look at it. If you don't have that ally or someone to go to, then you still have this document. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's true. I think, and it is just making us aware that we, we do. The fact that we're here, we're, if it's women in tech or you've struggled to make a dinner and get the family and go to work, that's remarkable some days. It's just uh, you've achieved something and, and those things all matter. Mm. Yeah, it's your superpowers. Now, uh, Dida, I know that, you know, maybe less on the imposter syndrome side, but still on that side, you know, um, being outspoken and a bunch of other sort of things were challenging for you early on in your career. Can you maybe share a little bit about that and some of the tools you use to help you? Yeah, of course. So as I mentioned, I got the coaching, which really, really helped me because with her, we focused on my strengths. And that was the first ever time somebody talked to me about my strengths. As, as Sarah said, we usually get hung up with, with, our, with the things we need to improve and just get stuck on it. Uh, but then um, I, made it a, I made myself my biggest project to improve all the time. And uh, even though I'm, I'm happy with myself, I just like to be a better version of myself every every year and as i said i conf my confidence was my um my biggest problem so i got therapy i still go to therapy i think everyone should go through their own therapy definitely um, because that's how you learn about yourself then you learn again your strengths and you learn when you need to get help and what type of type help you need uh, that's that's a really big thing to discover. I, I can't say I've discovered it all. Um, I did something called the Toastmasters, which I know some of you might know about. It's about public speaking and um, leadership. Um, they put you on the spot to talk about something for one minute, a very random topic. I know one of us is uh, doing their uh, championship uh, very soon. I won't name names. Well, <laughs> she's over there. I did stand-up comedy one year just to boost my confidence. And after doing that, nothing, nothing feels scary anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I did martial arts another year. Uh, yeah, for, for a year. So these are like hobbies I did for boosting my confidence and it really worked. Like I wouldn't imagine myself sitting here five years ago. No. Uh, yeah, but... Yeah. No, it's super useful. And for those in the room who are thinking, well, that's cool. I'm not the most outspoken human, but I'm not planning on ever, you know, sitting on a panel in the future. So that's fine. Remember that these skills will also help you in progressing in your career. You know, if you want to go into a management role, you need to be able to showcase that you can speak to an audience about something. Um, and so these things that pull us out of our comfort zone outside of work actually help us in our career progression inside of work. So don't let only fame and glory of being on a panel be your drivers. These things can help us um, in other parts of our career if we have to showcase to our manager. 
I can speak about these things, but I've never had an opportunity to present at a company update or do these other things. You can showcase that you're learning those skills outside of work. Can I add uh, something yeah, about the imposter syndrome. My biggest syndrome was like, I might not be saying the right things. Maybe I'm going to say something wrong and it, it would really scare me. But I, during this journey, I started saying, I don't know, out loud and at least once a week in a meeting with other people. And that's how I really uh, came over that feeling of being afraid when I might not know something to the best. Because in my area security, nobody knows everything. And I just came to the realization quite late, but at some time. And to support me also to feel more confident in saying I don't know, I also started listening to podcasts so that I keep on top of the knowledge. And then I say I don't know much easily now because I know that I don't know something, uh, yeah, if it makes sense. If I, uh, yeah, I can add something as well, because there's a few moments there when you were speaking about where, where feedback was brought up. And I think feedback for, um, for managers is like one of the best, best like tools we have to be able to support people in the teams. And it's one thing that I've had to learn how to give good feedback. And I think we try to help our managers learn how to give good feedback, because I think Good feedback is not, you know, you did great there. It's like, you did great. Why did you do great? Like, what exactly did you do that was great? And then you can take that away and, like, write it in your brag sheet. And, but also, when you have to give constructive feedback, right, it's not, about the, it's not about the person. It's not like, you are bad or you are this. It's like, that thing you did or that behavior you showed um, had this impact and here's a suggestion of how you could do it differently. So it's not about, it's about taking the personal out of it as well. So I think feedback is such a powerful tool for people who are in those managerial positions or any position really, because feedback can be given from, from any place um, is, is amazing. Yeah, there. I used to be really bad at giving, not bad for you, you know, sort of constructive criticism because I hate upsetting people. And then I read, I haven't finished it, I only read a bit of the book, um, but the Radical Candor book, and they use an example in that of this, it was a guy that was on the team and kind of wasn't performing as well. So the rest of the team kind of picked up things, redid his slides, did all the stuff. And eventually he got let go. And in the exit interview, they kind of mentioned all these things that he had you know, been falling short on. And he said, but why didn't, you didn't, why didn't you tell me? You never gave me the opportunity to get better. And so if we don't get more comfortable at giving more constructive feedback to our colleagues and receiving it, we don't give an opportunity for ourselves or someone else to get better. Um, there are humans that we give feedback to a million times over and they just don't hear it and that's fine, but rather give the opportunity to receive or give feedback, help someone become better. Um, Jared, I know you do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and stuff like that in the office. Could you share a bit about that? Yeah, it's one of, one of my favorite things that we do at Plan is this peer coaching. Um, it kind of straddles somewhere between the situational mentorship and, and the coaching. Basically, we, um, it's super informal. We basically match people up um, across the whole company who want to be coached on a particular aspect. And I think one of the most crucial elements of it is that it's not top-down coaching. Anyone can coach anyone because everyone's good at something. Um, and to give an example, like I, I got matched to coach our CEO and I, like, I was so nervous. <laughs> um, but, but it's actually helped, it's helped me a lot and I've seen it happen in other places. And so it's, it's a sort of short-term relationship. You kind of agree, this is what I want to work on. Um, here's how you can help me. And coaching is not about knowing all the answers. It's about how you provide a different perspective. It's like, have you thought about this? Or have you thought about doing it that way? And it's an amazing experience, both being coached and actually coaching. Um, when, you, when you're being coached, especially by someone not on your team, I think it's great to have someone who's in another part of the company just observe you and like what you do and how you work it gives you like visibility maybe through like another part of the company um, it gives you another perspective of how maybe another team is doing or handling a situation you're in and then coaching is just a great skill like whether you want to be a manager or not I think it's just a great skill to be able to help someone on their journey to be able to ask the right questions and and it's so rewarding to help someone uh, you know, overcome, see them overcome a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. It also boosts that confidence for yourself as well. 
Um, now, as I said, I've got loads and loads of questions on all the different angles, but this panel is for you. Um, has anyone got any questions for our panelists? Amazing. Hi. Um, this was like more for Sarah, but like well, kind of anyone. Um, but I feel like there is uh, some obvious changes within a lot of companies in terms of like welcoming women into their environment. So like saying like having tampons in the bathroom and stuff. But in the sort of contracts and the employment contracts, there's still like massive sort of inequalities. Um, now that can be in terms of like menopause or pregnancy or maternity or even just like stuff to do with contraception um, and any issues that might come along with that. Uh, like it doesn't count as sick leave a lot of the time. Um, have you kind of noticed any changes in your career over that, on, in that uh, regard? Yes. Um, menopause wasn't even allowed to be talked about for a long time. I think now we just about are. Um, absolutely. I mean, I've chosen, I guess what I, I should say that the companies that I've worked for, I choose carefully. So I, I probably see the better side at the moment. So I know that I look for those actually like companies that do care and do have policies and are proactive in that space and improving it. So even in that space, if I think where we are, where we are now, I know that we know it's not right, but there's an appetite to keep improving on it. Um, and then I, I hear from other people, there's this whole other side where I just think I would not want to work there where they just don't consider us at all. But yeah, I think it's getting better. And again, it's about awareness and bringing all that in, into place. And I think one of the game, what for me, a lot of the flexibilities, you know, it used to be presenteeism was really important, but recognizing that you can work from anywhere, it gives flexibility and it's about what you contribute is how we're measuring the kind of impact you can have in a company. It's not about the hours and the time, and that's helpful for women I, because it matters in that space. But yeah, I mean, it's not equal. I think there's a lot of disparity. My, always on these panels, the one thing that I always feel a little bit frustrated out is that the people that feel underrepresented or impartial seem to be the ones that have to give up their time to fight the cause. And that just feels a little bit wrong sometimes. And it, it's kind of, we as, if it's, if it's affecting us as me, I think, yeah, I want to go and make a point and say that, but it feels like it has to happen from everybody to want it to happen. Um, and as I say, I kind of, I'm lucky that I have worked in companies that do care and want to hear about it and want to be better, but yeah. I suppose a follow on to that, is there anyone, if people in the audience want to move to lovely companies like the ones you're in, is there any other than like the obvious, very like open things about what people are saying, is there anything they should be looking for in contracts when they're searching for companies that will help them to understand, you know, not going through a interview process, raise, you know, rose colored and then get this. How do you screen these companies to know how to join them? Yeah. I guess you get a feel for culture. You get a for, for me. I've and you kind of clearly in the interview process. You can almost ask. You know, you can see if there's. I can see myself there. Is there women there? Do they feel? Have they? Do they have like a very short turnaround time for employment, um, and a lot about what they care about. You'll hear that they invest in people. They'll hear about communities that are going on in in the company, and. The difficulty is I think sometimes it's a checkbox for companies to actually work out, no, you really do work there. And there's a lot of resources. And through these meetups, you'll meet people that kind of work in different companies and get a feel for, um, that sounds a good place to work. They, they do care. Um, and I, I feel quite lucky that I've got nice places to work and, and a place where I can go and say, we need a, a menopause policy, um, which I know they don't have, but they want to create one. And it's because people come and ask for it and they're, they're willing to listen. So that's, I think it's just that being open at communications, being how I can see it happening. Can I add, um, I think you, you get a really good picture in the interview, particularly when you have a clear idea of what your values are, because you can ask questions like interviews are two way street. 
but I don't think it's always fully representative. So what I would really um, recommend is like reaching out to some employees on LinkedIn. Like you're going to have to message quite a lot before you'll get any responses, but then you get a much clearer picture of what their culture actually is rather than just speaking to an interview panel. Mm. I ask to set up a call so they don't have to write anything down so they feel more comfortable telling me what it's really like to work there because I'm sure the last thing they want me to do is take a screenshot and post it all over the internet. So I'm like, if you're more comfortable, happy to have a casual call um, just to also allow them space. Yes? Yeah, I was just going to say, I agree that you said, and I think it would be great if you could all be super picky about which company you're going to, but I think when you're starting out in your career, sometimes you can't be super picky about the company. So what advice would you give to somebody going into a role where they are the only woman in the team and the company doesn't seem to be taking diversity and inclusion that seriously? What advice would you give in that situation? go into more communities where you will find more support maybe you'll find true networking you might find your next role in a better place it's making those connections just don't feel stuck and don't feel alone because there are many people like you and we're all in these communities helping each other the other thing to remember is if you look at your career like a startup rather than an end game um, if we look at like uh, Instagram, it was originally a messaging service. People started using the filters on the photos. They realized that was what people wanted. They pivoted and now they're a photo app, obviously very loosely there. We've got to treat our careers in the same way. So like if we go into companies that don't have very inclusive cultures or we don't like the role or whatever it may be, is every time we're changing within the organization or externally is I do this thing where I word vomit a whole bunch of things I love about my role and a whole bunch of things I hate about it. And then I circle the three non-negotiables on either side. What do I never want to do again? I cannot be micromanaged. I literally stop working. It's not about, not, no one likes to be micromanaged. I physically actually don't work. And there's some things that I just are non-negotiable that I have to have. And so you won't get all of them every time, but I try my best to pivot closer to the things I like and further away from the things I don't like. I'll then add three things I like and add two more new ones that I don't like. But if we treat our careers as this thing that pivots and changes, it allows us to create, hopefully, a role later on in our careers. Unfortunately, we do have to stick through some horrible places, but start to understand what we actually like. Because also, we then convince ourselves to take on jobs. We're like, I never want to work in that thing. And if we don't write it down, then when someone offers a job, we're like, hmm, that doesn't seem that bad. And then we're back in the same spot. So having the non-negotiables means that we try our best to say no to those roles. There's only so much research you can do about a company before going into it. So I do think, like, make sure you're checking yourself as you're in these companies that aren't, like, as welcoming to more diverse people. Um, and making sure that your limits aren't being crossed. And I think as soon as they are, you've got to protect yourself. And I think like, going from tr more traditional engineering into software, I do think software is so much better at this. There's so many startups out there and a lot more recognition of the issues we have with diversity. So just keep searching. <laughs> Yeah. I also say you should always be looking, not always be moving. Because mm -hmm. then when the right position comes, it's an easy move as opposed to now I'm at my wit's end. I feel broken. Um, my imposter syndrome's kicked in. I actually don't think I'm very good at my job anymore. So then that part of the search is really hard. We should, you know, when you get those messages on LinkedIn or different things, just always be having those conversations. You don't have to accept every role, but when the right role comes, it's easier to move than only looking later. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Raquel. Um, I don't know, I've been going to a lot of meetups, and when I go to ladies' meetups, there is always a lot of negativity about, oh, how I'm going to go for interview, how I'm going to do this, how, what happened, when I'm going to do my first day at job. Well, first of all, you know, what you need to do is just be ready, as ready as you can for interviews. If you don't know, if you are going after a job that you really like, go for some a little bit lower jobs so you can practice. And, uh, you know, once you get the job, come on, first, you know, uh, celebrate it, go mm. for it, go with the flow. No, don't be scared, just go for it. Yeah, I think we could all take a, a leaf out of that. Please, please, uh, 
meetings, mm. uh, meetups, always what happens with people if I look this way or that way or... Mm. Come on, ladies, let's go for real. Yes. <laughs> Take away. Let's go for it. Couldn't agree more. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for the insights. It's been amazing so far. Um, there was been a lot of talk about mentorship and how helpful that can be. Um, I think it's probably easier to get mentorship from the people you want to once you're in companies that you like working at. And so an open question for the panel is, what like specific action points would you recommend for people who are maybe in the audience now who are like in between jobs or looking to break into different industries who are from the outside looking in trying to like get into a mentorship? Is there like specific initiatives that you'd recommend or just like general action points? I um, am probably a big advocate of LinkedIn here. Try and, well, if you see companies that you like the look of, um, and you see someone working there that you think is quite interesting, just reaching out and sending a message saying like, look, I really look up to you. I'd love to have a chat. Um, nine times out of 10, that person's just gonna feel very flattered. So might have the chat with you. Um, and that's how I've actually gotten all my mentors so far. I've had one mentor where they've actually been in the same company as me but I haven't, I haven't really had many mentors like within the same company most of the time. Yeah, I don't think I've, I think I've had one mentor in my own company as well. It's all been external. Also, the nice thing about that for the people who are looking to transition in or come in is that when we build a relationship just like Dida did in the community, then when that role comes up, we've got a relationship with them. A lot of companies have referral bonuses and things like that to help bring humans in, but sometimes putting their kind of name on the line to refer you in is tricky when I don't know you. So if we reach out, we get to know each other, we mentor each other, we help each other, then that conversation becomes very easy. As you said, your you know, interview then became a conversation because they knew you. And so know that you can start those conversations where early in a more soft, passive way so that when it comes to it, it's, you don't feel like you're just you know, sort of asking for a handout. And they've got to know you and all your great skills and that you would be great for their company, even if you don't come from a quote unquote tech background. Yes. Well, you're saying that, but it's actually quite hard because, like, you reach out to people, some of them don't come back, and you're trying so hard not to take it personally because everybody's busy, they mm. have a life, and life happens. But um, it can be so disheartening when you've been looking, like, I put myself in that situation, been looking for a job for the past, like, four to six months now, um, transitioning from, you know, law into tech, and trying to. I always say it's just been a thing that's been bugging me for the past few months now, really driving me insane because I go to so many meetups. I, I don't think I'm backwards when I need to go forward, you know. Mm. And you talk to people, you meet them, you're trying to cultivate this relationship that you talk about. But it's 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 so hard because sometimes people just don't come back to you. And like I said, you don't take it personally, you keep forging ahead, right? But one of the things I'm finding so difficult is that you are not able to... So, I have a CV, I'm not saying it's the greatest, and I know, like you said, you know, you have, it's like a leaving thing, right? You keep on yeah. dating. But um, I feel like it's not easy to, for you to see me and, and the great, amazing package that I come with, right, on paper. I feel like I need to meet you to talk to you. But when I see most of the time, you, you don't have a job right here to give to me straight away, right? So it's, it's that thing where I feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place. Like I want to go out there, meet people, talk to them about me, but then it's like, well, there's nothing available for you. And then when I go to companies and I try to apply for jobs, it's like, well, um, are, you, are you looking for entry level? Or are you a graduate? Or, well, actually, you're not a graduate because you're not in school right now, like graduating from mm -hmm. university. But you're not really entry level because you are experienced. So, okay, fine, where do I go into? I go, okay, let's try, you know, not entry level, maybe like a year or two experience. And then it's like, well, actually, you're new because you're trying to transition into tech. It's driving me insane. One, I will say it is the most frustrating thing and your frustrations are heard and, you know, sort of down to, you know, don't know how long did I network in the community before she got that role. And so that role could be there for you tomorrow. We don't know. So one, know that the frustration is there and that is a fine feeling to have. Uh, the other thing is, is that there's, there are multiple angles you can do this in. So like, I know a few people in the law space that transitioned across, you know, reaching out to them and saying, can I have a mentor? And do you mind looking through my CV actually? Do you mind seeing how I should be wording these things to be more applicable to you? 
Lots of those. Okay. That's my, I'll see if anyone else I, has. Yes. I was going to say, we do quite a lot. Of, I've worked, been lucky enough to work with a sort of program through career changes, which sounds a little bit, you know, people have established careers but want to move into tech. And I know typically quite often it's through a boot camp or those processes. And within that, I know that there's a, there's a route in or there has been. I don't know, obviously, the path that you've taken, but um, there's a lot of companies that really value career changes. And I know when I was at Capgemini, they were ramping up the kind of we want career change, recognizing they've got all the skill set, maturity and understanding of the work environment and love tech. And that's all you need to do to be good at it is to love it and love learning. And I've seen and I've mentored people through that program. It's been through a boot camp program, but I know there's sort of elements that are available where you kind of put yourself through a, a program. I don't know if that's something that's accessible. Kind on of own. on that, you're potentially looking at LinkedIn, at people who've gone through Makers, General Assembly, and where they've ended up working on their first role, and maybe those are the companies to target first because they're aware of it, like Sneak We Hire, through boot camps, but we've actually got quite a few people in our engineering group, unfortunately no juniors at the moment, but who have self-taught and things like that, and companies who are more open to it, you know, may be more likely to look at a resume that's a bit different. Sorry, Georgina. Um, yeah, I'm also self-taught, <laughs> so I completely sympathize with where you're coming from. Um, I worked with an interesting company called Academy, um, helping to set up their mentorship program, but Academy itself is focused on how do we get these underrepresented groups into tech um, and I just wonder if that's something that you might want to look at. It's called academy.tech. Academy.tech. Yeah. Thanks Georgina. Tech Academy. Academy.tech. Academy. Academy. Yes. Um, do you think that in general men and women like to be men like to be managed in different ways and if so what advice would you give to um, male managers in terms of how to best manage and get the best out of women who they are managing. Is there one, someone specific you would? Uh, no, just interested in general um, I've, <laughs> I've had some, some learnings there. I think uh, over the last couple of years that I've become like a manager, um, I made some mistakes. The, f the best, the most like worst mistake being that uh, I managed how I would like to be managed, which was bad approach. Uh, for example, like I, I also hate being micromanaged and so therefore I have a very hands-on approach which worked for some people, didn't work for other people. And then I had some people in my team who are very structured, who like having an agenda for everything. Some people who are just very free-flowing, like being in the chaos and thrive in the chaos. And so actually like with that question, I've actually learned that every, every single person on my team is unique. And I've had to tailor my management style to, to every single person, whether they are uh, men or women or from different backgrounds. Um, and the most important thing there is like that I, um, we talk about a lot within managers in the company is just like active listening. Um, a lot of our one-on-ones, I, I spend most of the time listening and understanding like what they're doing, getting feedback and you know, what they're responding to. And that's been, that's been definitely a learning process, which I'm still going through. But, yeah, I, I do think everyone needs to be managed differently because everyone's different. But yeah, I'd love to hear other experiences. Plus one. Yeah, I agree with that too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that the only thing that I can think of it as th more the other way around, like how I think of it when I'm managing people, I know that for me and the, when I'm speaking with some of the people I manage who are women and men, there's a big difference when we're assessing. Sometimes it's a self-assessment in terms of progression I guarantee, I can literally, I know that every time I speak to the women, they are underselling themselves. Every time I, you know, where do you think you sit here? Or oh, I think I'm there. It's like, well, what, what may, but surely, and I think as a manager, you just don't have to recognize that that's the difference that I have to work at. So it's kind of coaching them to build up on that list. And that seems to be, um, as a manager, make sure you're kind of getting that understanding that often that is the case that people come in undersell themselves and the, the men, they don't oversell themselves sometimes but they just literally you know they never downplay it's like oh I think I, I need to learn more I don't know everything so 
I'm still where I am. Whereas, so it's, I, I ha it hasn't failed me yet when I'm thinking I know what's coming and that where they're going to put themselves. I recently went through a, a quarterly performance review and I'm also quite good at either saying exactly or under because we all have places to own. So I actually wrote my performance review and I gave it to ChatGPT, use AI, and I said, rewrite this as if I was a man um, and it was really interesting because um, it just said it, it was just way more factual and way more like I was like it's not a lie again so you know AI can help us um, and so I still you know filled it out I just then got some help from our robot friends uh, we've probably got enough time for maybe one we'll do two more questions so later I wonder um, with the feedback thing, so I'm doing an apprenticeship at the moment and we're really proactively encouraged to ask for permission to give feedback. I wonder how important you think that is in the workplace. I'm a new manager, so I'm kind of trying to feel out when it is and when it isn't appropriate to give feedback or what's too much in your opinion. <coughs> Where does that sit? Never enough. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think an open feedback culture is really, really good. And if you can get um, particularly peers giving feedback to each other, like in a free flowing way, it means that you've created a very psychologically safe environment. Um, I think like some characters, you perhaps have to be conscious to make sure that they're giving it in a very constructive way. Um, I can't remember who mentioned Radical Candor, was it? Yeah, okay. Making sure if you look at Radical Candor, like that it is very constructive and you're giving it in a kind way, but it's impactful rather than going off into like, a, what is it, obnoxious, aggressive or um, those sort of things. So just making sure you know where you sit on that matrix and perhaps like teaching that matrix to your direct reports to help them understand like, how to give beneficial feedback. But yeah, never enough. <laughs> so one of the, so we give out radical candor to everyone in the company when they join. It's an amazing book, everyone. It's like highlight everyone. But actually, um, so there's, there's, you have to care personally about, about the person. You have to give direct feedback. But uh, sometimes people forget about the caring part. They think like, I have to give feedback, so I'm just going to give feedback. But they don't take time to get to know the person understand them, like listen to them, check in on them, like how are you doing, you know, how was your weekend, how's your family or how's your dog and how's your holiday, like just get to know them and, and actually it starts with caring and then when you care then everything becomes much easier because actually the person on the, other, on the receiving end of the feedback knows that you're doing it from a good place, not from a place of wanting to antagonize them or wanting to bring them down. Um, so I'd say if there's a culture where you're having to sort of uh, maybe ask for permission to give feedback or that, then maybe I'd think about how do you create more of that caring between people? How do you create the space for them to chat and get to know each other and then things flow from there, I guess. Also visually showing when managers give each other feedback helps other people. You know, we talk about being open and stuff and then it's very much a manager telling their team to give feedback to each other. And the best times I've ever seen it or where I've been more comfortable is when I've seen it being done in all levels. Uh, and be received well and, you know, sort of given with caring, but sometimes it is constructive and the person hasn't, you know, flown off the bat, then I know I can go and give my manager feedback without them, you know, firing me. Um, and so <laughs> showcasing feedback is also, I think, very useful. We had one more question over here, yes. Um, we mentioned a lot about imposter syndrome and how women have a tendency to undersell their expertise. Um, what do you do when you find yourself in an opposing situation? Less imposter syndrome and more ambition penalty. So you do feel very comfortable in a role that you know that you know what you're doing, but you don't feel like you're in an environment where you can sit and go, I'm actually quite good at this. What are my next steps? How do I progress? Because I feel like in, there are certain working environments where actually that woman is not labelled as assertive, she is labelled aggressive, she's yeah. not a leader, she's bossy. Yeah. How do you handle that it's not necessarily imposter syndrome, it's actually an ambition penalty within the environment you're working in? I have an example. Um, but we have a career framework and that has really helped me uh, um, um, in promoting one of my ladies uh, two times in two years so because it's not very common for a person to get promotion twice in two years 
It's, but she's really good. She knows she's really good. I know she's really good. Uh, but having that framework really helped me to show to the people who have to write their na name under, na under that promotion as well to see, uh, making a really good business case for them. Yeah, I've been labeled that a lot, uh, bossy, outspoken. Um, the best advice I got was making it all data driven. So the first time someone said no to something, I was like, cool, so what do I have to do? And I got them to write it down. Or I emailed them back, being like, great, from our conversation, you said, in order for me to get this next promotion, I need to demonstrate X, Y, and Z. Then say it was six months a year. During that time, I'd keep checking in, like, is this the way you want me to demonstrate this? Because I didn't want to get to the end of the year. And I was like, oh, I've done this thing. And they're like, mm, but you didn't do it in the way I wanted you to do it, so no. <laughs> so concept being like, oh, we're on the right thing. And then it became, it's just black and white data. You said I need to do X, here it is, can I have it? Still get labeled now as bossy sometimes, all the rest of it. But I found that just leading with data just takes that whole human feeling out of it. Because it is an element of imposter syndrome in a different way. Um, and so we're like, when do we I need to change? When I think about it, she did do that to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. What have I got to do? And, yeah. Um, and then I've had it once where I've done all that and they've said no. And I've given them the space to go, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. And then I chose to leave. Uh, but knowing that there is an element of also educating and enabling your managers to know how to unfortunately deal with someone like, you know, like something they have to get used to too. So there's a little bit of empathy both ways, but when it's data, it's black and white most of the time. Yeah, cool. Well, to wrap up, I want to ask the panelists one more question and then I promise we'll go. Um, cause I want to make sure that we all go away with something. It's lovely coming to these events and hearing all these great things and we feel all inspired and then we go home and we do nothing. Um, so if there was one takeaway the audience took from tonight's panel discussions, maybe we didn't get to it with a million questions, um, that you'd love them to take away and do, what would it be? Did also I? therapy. Okay. <laughs> you need to know yourself if you want to be better. Perfect. Tough one to follow. Yeah. Um, I think if we're saying, so this panel is about empowerment and what my fundamental belief is, is if we empower diverse teams, we will build better products that have a better resonance with society. And through that, I really feel like that's how we'll achieve more equality. Um, so I guess as, as the man on the panel, my, my, I have maybe advice, better advice for other males here who want to support. And especially if you're in a management position, uh, one thing that's helped me a lot is just to have, to talk to other managers and just have an open space where you talk about how are you supporting your teams? What are you learning? Um, and being open and vulnerable in those settings about your mistakes. Uh, I think that's, that's been really useful for me and just listening um, as much as possible. Um, for me, I think I'd probably love it if you took away that whatever you're feeling or whatever your obstacles are, that there's a path for you. I think tech is great. I think there's amazing opportunities. We're getting better and better. We're having these conversations. So I'd love, although we haven't got a perfect world, that there's hope that everyone can see there's a way to do it. and tech's one of the few areas where you can have career changes, you don't have to come from a degree background, and you are valued and, and the industry wants and values diversity. So I'd just love to feel like people have got confidence to kind of forge the career they want um, from it. And I'd like to say that even though these panelists are absolutely amazing, so are you. So please, we've got about just over half an hour left until we get kicked out. Um, please talk to each other. The insights and things that you can get from each other might even be more important than sort of what we've been discussing here. Your mentors are in this room, your networks, your future colleagues, maybe future bosses, direct reports are all sitting here. So don't forget to chat to each other. Yes. Our panelists will be around until the end of the night, and I think we're going to the pub afterwards. Maybe some of them will join us. But um, talk to each other, please. Thanks. <laughs>